This video is brought to you by John Robson Guitar Tuition. If you enjoy the content, please consider supporting the channel by enrolling on a course, purchasing some guitar lessons or a t-shirt, or you can join my Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. This video today is the first in a series of videos that I'm going to be doing on the topic of music theory and uh, basically I want these videos to be very much driven by you chaps. Um, if there is a particular aspect of music theory that is puzzling you or if there's something you're curious about or there's something that you just for one reason or another can't quite get your head around then I want to hear from you. Drop me an email via the website you can see uh, the address up there at the top of the screen. Uh, just let me know what's on your mind and I'll probably end up making a video about it. Now, I put this out there a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think it was on one of the live streams, one of the Friday live streams and said, you know, let me know if there's any aspects of music theory you're curious about. And the overwhelming response was, please explain what's going on with the cycle of fifths or circle of fifths as it's uh, often called. Um, so that's what we're talking about today. Now, briefly, uh, the circle of fifths is embedded right into the DNA of music. That's why it tends to crop up so often. And um, if you go all the way back to the ancient Greeks, uh, a chap by the name of Pythagoras, he discovered two important musical relationships. The one that we today call the octave, which basically means that you can get higher and lower versions of the same note, and the relationship that we today call call the fifth, which means you can take a note and then generate a new note from that, and then a new note from that one, and a new note from that one. And you can, because of the octave relationship, you can get higher and lower versions of those of each of those notes. So, what use is all of this? Well, we're going to look at uh, five uses of the cycle of fifths today. Uh, but first, we really need to get a handle on exactly what it is. Okay then, here's the C major scale. Let's have a listen to it. So you can see that the notes in that scale that you've just heard are C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and back to C again. And you can also see how those notes are spaced out. Each um, square on this grid is essentially one semitone. So you're going up uh, basically two semitones, then another two, then one, then two, then two, then two, then one. That is the major scale formula or step pattern. What we're going to do now is take the fifth note of the C major scale, which as you can see is a G, and we're going to start a major scale based on that note. That will give us the G major scale. And that sounds like this. <laughs> Then, once again, what we're going to do is we're going to take the fifth note of the G major scale, which as you can see is D, and we're going to create a major scale based on that note, the D major scale. Here it is. And you get the picture by now. We now take the fifth note of the D major scale, which is an A, and build a major scale starting on that note. And once again, the fifth note of the A major scale is an E, so let's look at the E major scale. Then the fifth note of the E major scale is a B note, so let's put that in the starting position and go up our 2 2 1 2 2 2 1 step pattern to get the B major scale. Next, we take the fifth note of the B major scale, which is an F sharp, and we get uh, a major scale based on that. Here it is, the F sharp major scale. And you'll notice in that scale there, there is an E sharp note as the seventh note. There is no such note as E sharp. That is actually an F note, but we call it E sharp here because, in case you're wondering, the uh, the etiquette or protocol, if you like, when it comes to using sharps and flats, is you don't use the same letter twice. So you can't have an F note and an F sharp note in the same scale. So under these circumstances, we refer to the F as an E sharp. Anyway. I digress. Let's take the fifth note of the F sharp major scale. That's a C sharp. Now let's call it a D flat and build the D flat major scale. And the reason why we called it a D flat there incidentally was because if we didn't, if we called it a C sharp and we went C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, 
F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, B sharp, C sharp. You get another one of those awkward little things where you're having to call a C note by the name of B sharp. And it's just, you know, we want to try and minimize that kind of thing. You get that uh, unavoidably, whichever way you do the F sharp major scale. But, you know, we can avoid it in this case here by referring to the C sharp major scale as a D flat major scale. Anyway, let's take the fifth note of that, which as you can see is A flat and build an A flat major scale. <laughs> There you go. Now, once again, we go to the fifth note, which is an E flat. Let's build the E flat major scale. And then the fifth note of the E flat major scale is a B flat. So let's have the B flat major scale. And what's the fifth note of the B flat major scale? That is F. So let's have the F major scale. And the fifth note of the F major scale, as you can see, is a C note. So that takes us back to where we started again, with the C major scale. So we've started with the C major scale, and we've gone to the fifth note of that scale, then the fifth note of the scale we get from that, and so on and so on, going to the fifth note each time. And we end up going around in a big circle, coming back to the C major scale again. Hence why it's called the circle, or cycle of fifths. Right then, so that sort of summarises what the cycle of fifths is, and, and you know, how it's derived. Now let's have a look at it um, at one of its uses which is really quite useful for helping you know what key you're in and what chords are in that key okay then here is the cycle of fifths that we recently derived and just to recap there at the top of the dial you can see c and the fifth note in a C major scale is G, the fifth note in a G major scale is D, the fifth note in a D major scale is A, and so on and so on. So what use can we put this to? Well, one immediate and uh, quite easy uh, thing you can do with this is use it to figure out what chords are in any key. This is obviously useful if you want to know what chords go together and sound good together if you're writing a song or just trying to figure a song out. So, all you have to do is take the, uh, or find rather, the key that you're interested in. Let's go with C. There it is at the top of the dial and then go to the chord either side of it. And you can see that in the key of C, you have the chords of C, F and G. If we were to do the key of G, you would see that we've got the chords of G, C and D. The key of D contains the chords of D, G and A. The, the key of A contains the chords of A, D and E. We're only dealing with major chords here. We'll come to the minor ones in a second. But you can see that just by stepping this little arc around the scale, you can figure out what the major chords are in any key. There's the key of E flat, for example. Uh, contains the chords of E flat, A flat and B flat as major chords. This is um, a much easier way of figuring out what are the major chords in any key rather than, you know, kind of just trying to fathom it out by deriving a major scale and, you know, and, and stepping through it like that. You can just look at the cycle of fifths and see it pretty much instantly. So what about minor chords then? Well, we need to look at this relationship here. Essentially, you know, think of it as the 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock position. Um, basically, C... Uh, is a major chord and every major chord has a relative minor. Okay, every major scale has a relative minor. Every major pentatonic has a relative minor. Every major entity has a relative minor and vice versa. Every minor thing has a relative major. And what we've got here is C major, the relative minor is A minor. And G major, the relative minor is E minor. D major, the relative minor is B minor. A major, the relative minor is F sharp minor and so on. So let's think, let's go back to the key of C again. Let's imagine you want to know what are the chords, all of the chords in the key of C, the majors and the minors. Well, as you know, you've got the C, the F and the G, and you've got the relative minors of those three chords. So as you can see, the relative minor of C is A minor, the relative minor of F is D minor, and the relative minor of G is E minor. So there are your six primary chords, we'll call them, in the key of C. C, F, G, uh, A minor, D minor, E minor, or put them into order, C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor. Those are your six important chords in the key of C, which makes it easy to figure out what chords are in any key. Again, you're not having to, um, you know, 
go to the trouble of deriving the major scale and harmonizing the scale and then getting the, you know each chord from each particular degree of the scale you can just figure it out very quickly by knowing these two relationships on the cycle of fifths so that's use number one for the cycle of fifths so now you have a pretty good hopefully understanding of knowing what what uh, chords are in any key but as you may be aware songs don't always stay in the same key and if you're trying to write a song or if you're trying to figure out a song that somebody else has written that you need to play in your band or you just want to you know kind of get your fingers around it yourself then um having a little bit of knowledge of uh how songs are written and how songs change key is often a very very good starting point to, to build on so here's how the cycle of fifths can help you with that Okay, here's our cycle of fifths that we've uh, been using. And if you were paying attention, in the last segment at least, you will know that you can use the information derived from this uh, lovely thing to discover what chords are in any key. And uh, here they all are. Here are all of the chords in all 12 keys. And what you begin to notice is that the closer together any two keys are on this cycle, the more chords they share. Let's take a look at the key of C major. You can see that that has the chords of C, D minor, E minor, F, G and A minor. Then if we look at the key of G, you can see that that has G, A minor, B minor, C, D and E minor. Or put another way, if you take the key of C and turn the D minor into a D major and replace uh, the F with a B minor, you've now got the key of G. So what this means on a practical level is that let's imagine you're trying to figure out a song and you pretty much got it nailed and you know that you're in the key of G. But then there's a chord that comes along and you can't figure it out and it doesn't seem to be one of the chords that's available to you in the key of G. Well, just look at the keys either side of the key of G and you're probably going to find the chord that you're uh, trying to track down in one of those two keys. The closer that keys are to each other on this dial, the more closely they are related. The further away they are, the more distantly they are related basically because the further away you get the less chords you share with the chord with the key that you started on and if you're looking for a subtle key change just for the odd chord a little bit of modal interchange if you remember that lesson a few weeks ago uh, then you know just go to the key either side if you're looking for something much more dramatic like for instance the change from d minor in the uh, intro and chorus of a song like layla to c sharp minor in the um, in the verses then you know it's much more distant on the dial here and therefore will sound much more dramatic so basically knowing how closely or distantly keys are related to each other gives you a better chance of being able to figure out what chords are in a song that you're struggling with or maybe gives you a fresh take on how to include new chords in a song that you're writing valuable knowledge either way you use it and it's all right there on the cycle of fifths and if you are ever confused by um, knowing what notes you're playing at any given time you know usually maybe when you're using a pentatonic scale pattern um, you possibly don't know the notes in that pentatonic scale that you're playing well the cycle of fifths can help with that as well okay then here's something that should look rather familiar our old friend the a minor or we're going to call it by its major name today the c major pentatonic scale and the notes in that scale are c d e g and a okay now let's compare that to the cycle of fifths do you notice anything Indeed, yes, the first five notes of that cycle, uh, if you start on C, go C, G, D, A, E. Those are the five notes of the C major pentatonic scale. The pentatonic scale is in fact derived from the cycle of fifths if you go all the way back to ancient Greece, but that's a whole other story. The point I'm making here is that if you know that you need a C major pentatonic scale, you just take the first five steps of the cycle of fifths uh, starting on a C. If you want the G major pentatonic scale, you just 
take the first five steps starting from a G. D major pentatonic scale is the first five steps of the, the cycle um, starting from a D and the first five steps of the cycle starting from an A gives you the A major pentatonic scale. And then if you know your relative majors and minors that we covered earlier, that means that you will all already know that the um, C major is the, is the A minor pentatonic and the D major is the B minor and the G major is the E minor and so on. So this is is yet another use of the cycle of fifths, figuring out what notes are in a pentatonic scale, which is an important uh, piece of knowledge because that will help you figure out where notes are on the fretboard and make it easier to target notes in chords when you're playing solos and all manner of useful things. Once again, you can either meticulously work it out from first principles or you can just take a look at the cycle of fifths and it will tell you. And on the topic of knowing what notes you're playing, it is handy to know what notes are in whatever key you're playing in. And the cycle of fifths can help with that as well. Okay, another use for the cycle of fifths is how to recognise key signatures. Now, maybe you're not interested in learning to read written music notation, but it does have its uses, uh, knowing how many sharps or flats there are in any given key. And as you can see here, the key of C major contains the notes of C, D, E, F, G, A, B and C. No sharps or flats. So there are no sharps or flats in the key signature. Then if we move round to the key of G, you can see that if you start that uh, double two, one, two, 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 one, tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone, major scale step pattern that we looked at earlier, from a G note, you get the notes of G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp and G. So there is one sharp in the key signature of G major, F sharp, and you can see there it is on the, uh, on the treble clef there. Moving around to the key of D, we have two sharps, F sharp and C sharp, and there you can see them on the key signature. The key of A has three sharps, C sharp, F sharp and G sharp. Once again on the uh, key signature, there you can see them shown there. The key of E has F sharp, G sharp, C sharp and D sharp, four sharps, and you can see those four sharps in the key signature. So when you see four sharps in a key signature, you know you're in the key of E. Then moving around to the key of B, we have C sharp, D sharp, F sharp, G sharp, and A sharp, five sharps, and there they are on the key signature. Then, finally, in this direction, we're going to go to the key of F sharp, which, as you can see, has six sharps, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, C sharp, D sharp, and E sharp, which is another name for F. We covered that earlier. Now, if we go any further clockwise around this dial, we're going to start ending up with notes that are double sharp basically where you have to sharpen a note and sharpen it again. So what we're going to do now is go back to the key of C major and there it is and we're going to go anti-clockwise round the uh, dial this time. So coming to the key of F major you can see that that has the notes of F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E and F and there's the, uh, the single flat on the uh, key signature. So one flat is the key of F. Two flats, as you can see, is the key of B flat. You've got the B flat and the E flat in there. Three flats is the key of E flat. Uh, e flat, A flat and B flat. Uh, four flats is the key of A flat, where you've got A flat, B flat, D flat and E flat. Five flats is the key of D flat, D flat, E flat, G flat, A flat and B flat. Those are the five flats in that key and there you can see them on the key signature. Then if we go one step further, we're going to go to what we previously called the key of F sharp. Here it is as the key of G flat. And you can see that we have six flats. We have G flat, A flat, B flat, C flat. We'll come back to that in a moment. D flat and E flat. There are your six flats. Now, what's that C flat all about? Well, it's another name for B. The reason we don't call it B, the reason why we call it C flat, is because remember, you don't use the same letter twice in uh, the name of a scale. So if you 
you've already got B flat, you can't use B. So you call the B a C flat. So there you go. Those are the key signatures. There they all are mapped out like that. So you can tell by how many sharps or flats there are in the key signature, what key you are in, simply by referring to the cycle of fifths. Basically go clockwise and it's uh, telling you how many sharps there are in a key signature. Go anti-clockwise. It's telling you how many flats there are. And now let's go back to this whole idea of chords and how they relate to each other. Uh, last week I did a video on the topic of um, secondary dominant chords, basically adding chords in from outside the key using a, a particular type of relationship that is, once again, based upon the cycle of fifths. Okay, then take a look at this chord sequence. It's using the chords of C, F, A minor and G in various combinations. Let's have a listen to it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it could do with perhaps a little bit of livening up. And we're going to do that livening up by using some secondary dominant chords. Now, I did a video on these last week, and I'll link to that in the description if you're not sure what they are. But basically, what we're doing here is introducing new chords into the sequence. And these chords will be from outside the parent key, which in this case is C major. Where are these chords coming from then? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to target a couple of the chords in this sequence, namely the A minor chord and the G chord, via their five chords. Okay, so what that means is we're going to look at the cycle of fifths. Here it is. And if we're thinking of what is the fifth of an A minor, well, you just locate the A on that dial, and there it is. And you go to the fifth of that A, which is an E. So before the A minor, in this case, uh, in the chord sequence, we're going to place an E chord. And it's usually played as an E seventh. So before the A minor chord in the chord sequence, we are going to play an E seventh, because E is the fifth of A, and A is the root note of the chord we want to go to. A minor. Then, if we're thinking about uh, using a secondary dominant chord to go to the G, let's have a look at what's uh, the fifth of G, and we can see that it's D. So, before the G chord, we place a D seventh. That is another secondary dominant chord. So, here's the chord sequence again, with the two secondary dominant chords shown in red. And now let's have a listen to what effect that has on the sound of the chord sequence. So there you go. That is um, basically how you use the cycle of fifths to uh, generate secondary dominant chords, which, you know, I think you would agree that second example that I played there was just that little bit more interesting to listen to. It had a bit more variety to it and seemed to have more direction as it went from, say, the E7 chord to the A minor and the D7 chord to the G. It just adds a little bit of momentum that drives the chord sequence along. And as I say, um, all of the um, techniques of all of the knowledge of how to um, use those type of chords are basically embedded in the cycle of fifths. So there you go. That is just my rundown of five uses of the cycle of fifths or circle of fifths, whatever you want to call it. There are literally you know, hundreds more uses you can put this to. But those are the ones that I find the most useful for a, you know, kind of um, a workaday guitar player like me. 
If you are a Patreon supporter of mine, then first of all, thank you. Um, all of those um, little animations, those little clips that you've seen there are all up on my Patreon page. There's the address. Link is in the description for you to download and use as a, referen a source of re reference material, rather. Uh, and I'll also put together a PDF that uh, summarises it all, so you've got some written material there that you can look at as well. Um, and that is pretty much it for today, folks. I hope you found the video useful uh, and informative and if you have please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already done so and why not give me a like while you're at it don't forget the live stream on friday 5 p.m uk time uh, we sit around and have a beer and talk about things whatever things that crop up um usually guitar and music related but all topics are fair game it's a fantastic way to kick off the weekend and i would love to see you there if you can make it but for now i'll bid you all a good day and say thank you so much for watching thank you for your time look after yourselves folks stay well stay safe and above all stay sane bye for now